There's a story in the Old Testament that I'd like to share with you today. And uh, I, I believe this story illustrates the character of God and, and the character of people and his interaction with the people. And um, it connects with joy. It really does. And then we'll kind of explore what the connection is there. So when we look into the Old Testament, we see that there's different characters throughout the, the Bible that, um, that walk closely with God. Some walk very closely with God and others were not close with God, and we see kind of how it all plays out for those that were close to God and those who weren't. Now, two of the men that walked closely with God that I'd like to bring up today were men by the name of Nehemiah and Ezra. Now, Nehemiah, he was uh, kind of a political guy, and he served as the cup bearer for the king of Persia. And that's when the Persian Empire ruled that part of the world. And Ezra, Ezra was a spiritual leader. He was a priest of God, and uh, he was the, the high priest of Israel at that time. Now, the people in the land of Israel, they had uh, been exiled. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, you see the story of how the Israelites were led into the promised land and they were told to take possession of it and to rid the land of idols and to keep their hearts pure from idolatry, worshiping idols. But we see how Israel as a nation failed to do this. And, and they didn't follow God wholeheartedly and they allowed idols and things that were more important to them, uh, to them than God get in the way of their relationship with God. And, and they openly rebelled against the Lord. Now God, when we're openly rebellious, he's, He loves us too much just to let us go and to let us get away with it. And... Um, the Israelites were God's people. And, and despite numerous warnings by the prophets that the Lord would send to the Israelites to turn away from their worshiping of gods that were not even really gods, they wouldn't listen. The majority of them continued in their wayward behaviors. And because of their disobedience, um, their enemies were given victory over them. And Israel was absolutely overrun. Now the first exodus out of Israel, or the first captivity, was from the Assyrian Empire. And then we see the Babylonian Empire with Judah and Benjamin, the two remaining tribes, swept away the, the, the people that were in the land and took them into Babylon, into captivity. And, and there they served the king of Babylon, until Babylon was overthrown by Persia. And um, the tribes of Benjamin and, and Judah were in captivity in the land of Babylon, and uh, in the end under the rule of Persian authority, for 70 years. Now God made it very plain that the reason He removed them from the land was to purge the idolatry out of their hearts so that they could come back to the land. He fully intended to bring them back to the land and to renew them with new hearts. So, God's plan was to take them from the land of Babylon and bring them back to Jerusalem, which was the capital, and to have the walls around that place where they, they, they formerly lived rebuilt so that the city could be inhabited and protected from the enemies that didn't like Israel and wanted to destroy Israel. And um, they were to rebuild the temple, the place where, that was set aside for God to be worshipped in their midst. So Ezra was instrumental in establishing the new temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians and and Nehemiah was responsible for building the walls. Now, they started rebuilding, and they, st they were given blessing from the king of Persia to go back. 
And they started rebuilding, and there was enemies. And there was people in that area that did not want things to be rebuilt. And they fought against Nehemiah. They fought against Ezra to, to try and keep everything from happening, keep the walls from being built up. The enemy wanted to have free access to the city, to the place where the people of God would be living. Didn't want them to reestablish. So although we have these enemies, God protected Nehemiah and Ezra and their endeavors and everyone with them. I'm just going to read to you the section of Scripture. After some time, the walls were finally finished. And they were ready to start uh, worshiping God and living in safety behind the walls of Jerusalem once again. And they called an assembly. Nehemiah and Ezra called an assembly, and all the leaders that were on their team with them called an assembly to, of the people together. And here's what we read in Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of all the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Matthiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbanada, Zechariah, and Meshalem. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebah, Jam, and Achab, Shabbathe, Hodea, Messiah, Kilila, Zariah, Josabad, Hannah, and Palila instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites and all who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not weep or mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping. They were weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy, enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because now they understood the words that had been made known to them. Wow, what a story. The Israelites who had been banished from their own place that, that had been crushed in their own place and taken away and and they wept because they realized they realized how broken they were they realized how much they had turned their backs on the ways of God and how far they had fallen so they they wept in repentance before God and this was the state of the assembly so, Pastor, 
What's this story got to do about Advent, the Advent of Chris, Christmas, and the, and the subject of joy? Well, in this story, Nehemiah and Ezra were representing God to bring the people to a recognition that the reason why their lives had been exiled and broken and, and the reason why they weren't able to live in safety in the place that they were planted was because they had let idols come up into their lives and become more important than God. And God loved them too much to allow that to happen. So in His loving discipline, the nation was disciplined by God and was taken away to Babylon. But God foresaw what He wanted to do. He wanted to bring them back to Himself as, as people with a renewed heart. And there was sorrow and, and weeping when they realized this. The terrible thing that had happened to them was because of their rebellion. But notice Nehemiah and Ezra actually told the Israelites, stop your weeping. Stop your mourning, people. Because your God is here with you. And He, he has given you deliverance and he has brought you back home so that you can be you can be restored and then they created a holy day you notice the name holiday is actually holy day h o l i d a y this is holy day h o l y d a y but that comes from the same root christmas is a holiday. It's a holy day. And we see how the world has twisted and warped it and become about the Grinch and about Santa Claus and about Jingle Bells and, and elves and all this whole nonsense, right? That's not anything to do with the holy day where we recognize the fact that Christ has come and has come to set His people free to take what was broken and to mend it and to make it whole. We're preparing for Christmas. And on the eve of birth, the birth of Christ, we read in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, and there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them in the glory of of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Wow, that was the, that was the heralding of it. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. See, Ezra, sometimes when you look in the Old Testament, you see precursors to what comes later. There's like little illustrations of what God's trying to do. And when you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament has often been said by scholars to be the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And these stories that we hear in the Old Testament point to the cross. Just as much as in the New Testament, the things that we hear and the teachings that we have point back to the cross. It's all focused on the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's all focused on the creator and sustainer of all things. The living Word of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. God restored Israel at the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. And he, and he called them to celebrate their restoration and to celebrate with this holy day. And it was this prefiguring reality of salvation that would one day come through Christ. 
and the joy that Ezra and Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That joy was given to them by God. But that joy has been offered to us through God's Savior, through our Messiah, Jesus. In John chapter 1, 14, we read this, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, they brought out the book of the law. And that was a precursor to Jesus coming to us to speak into our lives, not just as the book, but the living Word of God. When we look at Jesus, we see God in all His majesty. Jesus, the revelation of the Father to us. The old Christmas carol says it well. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. The joy that Christ brings to us today as his people is the joy of salvation. The Bible tells us that joy has come to us because the love of the Father has been lavished upon us as His children. And Jesus spoke about the joy and how it's all connected together. As the Father has loved me, He said in John 15, 9 to 11, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and I remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See? Do you understand? The Lord wants you to be filled with His heavenly joy. He wants you to remember all that He has done for you in coming down to the earth and being, being born as a man to die for your sins and to raise Himself from the dead to give you eternal life. Paul stated this in Romans 15, 13. He stated, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All these things God's given to us. When we come to know Jesus as our Savior and the living Word of God that has been written to us, we come to understand that love has been lavished on us by the Father by filling us with the Holy Spirit after we've been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. And it washes us so that we're prepared as a clean vessel for the Lord to make His home. Now, joy. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. You might say, might be, maybe you're sitting here today and you go, I don't have a lot of joy. Doesn't think, things don't go very well in my life a lot of the time. Does this mean that, does joy mean that we're always going to have happiness? What's the difference between joy and happiness? There's a difference, you know. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Now, Remember back in the story in Ezra there, Ezra and Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is our strength. They had, I think his name was Sanballat, and he was like the enemy, and he was trying to destroy them. They were not living in comfort. These guys were building the wall with a sword in one hand and and, uh, and mortar and and bricks in the other hand. This was not easy. Life isn't always going to be happy, my friends. God doesn't promise that. If you've heard that from some preacher somewhere, 
throw that out. That's not scriptural. You know, I, I think this comes sometimes from, uh, from uh, the pivotal things that Western culture have, have been taught to us, right? That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's in the core fabric of our culture. Now, I'm not, it's, it's not wrong to be happy. It's not wrong. And it's not wrong to want to be happy. But that is not the same thing that we're talking about here this morning that comes from God. You see, the Bible doesn't actually say directly a lot about happiness. But it's absolutely filled from cover to cover with references talking about joy. See, happiness is an emotion. It's an emotion where one experiences feelings ranging from contentment and satisfaction to a sense of bliss sometimes and and pleasure. And, And happiness, we all know it, it's fickle. It requires happy circumstances before we have it. It brings pleasure and it's it's kind of like a solid, I guess you could say. Happiness is like, if, you, if your life is a container, happiness is like a solid. It's like a, a solid block that's placed inside of you as a container, right? It can easily be placed in, and it can easily be taken out. Well, joy, on the other hand, okay, joy is a little different. Joy warms our spirit, and it, and it doesn't get chased off by troubles. So it doesn't just get removed when troubles come. It sticks with us. It connects with us. And it gives us meaning and purpose and brings contentment. Joy joy is often triggered when we witness or, or achieve selflessness to the point of personal sacrifice when we pour ourselves out for others, including God. Joy is connected with this. It comes when we're feeling spiritually connected with God or relationally connected with other people that God's placed around us. You see, joy is more like, happiness is like a solid. Joy is more like a liquid that is poured into us and just gets into every crevice and seam in the container. It just, it fills us and is deep-seated Joy is a a deep-seated contentment that's not dependent upon the circumstances. Troubles come and troubles go, and good things come and good things go. But joy remains in the midst of it all. Paul, he says this, he says, "Joy, Joy has very much to do with contentment. If you're content, right, that's joy. That, that's giving you contentment. Paul said this in Philippians 4, 12 to 13. He said, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. The joy of the Lord is strength. See the connection? I think Paul was referring to the fact that the joy of the Lord was his strength to be content in whatever circumstances he found himself living under. You know, last week I talked to you guys about peace, right? Where peace is actually a a choice. And there's a choice actually to push away from the table of anxiety. You see, it's a choice. That's why it says don't be anxious because we have a choice that God's given us. Don't be anxious. There's a choice there. Now, in the same manner, we can also live in discontentment. We can choose to live in discontentment or joy. Yes? It is God who gives us the strength to embrace joy to embrace contentment, to embrace um, peace. He gives us that strength. And we can't do it on our own. This isn't something we can just work up. No, the Spirit of God gives us the strength to do it, but He also gives us a choice to walk in step with the Spirit. 
See, if we walk in step with the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the sin nature. The sin, sin nature is selfish. The sin nature is not giving. The connection between joy and giving is also there's a connection between discontentment and selfishness. Push away from the table of discontentment. Say, no, Jesus has given me life. He's saved me. He's given me eternal life. And there's joy in Him. I choose not to take upon my shoulders those things that are not pleasing to the Lord. And why do I say that joy is a choice? Well, the Scriptures tell us why. The Scripture says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. The scriptures tell us, rejoice always. See the choice there again? Rejoice always. It's asking us to step out in joy and purposely rejoice. I remember, and I've told this story maybe in a sermon a while ago, but it's just, it's one of those landmark things. You know how you have landmark things in your life where God shows you something? I was sick. I was so ill. I was throwing up and the other way too. It was just like horrible and I had this high fever. I was all by myself and I was in my college dormitory. And um, I felt like Someone, please just put me out of my misery. You know, take a big hammer and knock me over the head. That's how it felt. I was horribly sick. And as I was sitting there, I'm like, God, this is, you know, like I know that you heal. I know that you heal. So would you take this infirmity away from me? Would you help me to feel better? Please. I feel so horrible. And you know what the answer was? It was almost, it was loud. It was, sometimes God speaks quietly, most of the time actually. Speaks very quietly in whispers. But there's once in a while where God just sort of goes, this is what you need. Oh, okay. And what he said in my spirit is he said, son, I want you to praise me. Like, I don't feel like praising you. I feel sick. I just want this to go away. I don't feel like praising you, God. And he's like, praise me. Really? Praise you? Yeah, praise me. And I remember, and this is one of those monumental things that God puts in your life, you know. Everyone has little things like this, or sometimes big things that God just shows you his, his, his person, and, and he shows you things. And, and you look back on that in the rest of your life, and you think, wow, that's neat. Well, I, 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 I submitted to the Holy Spirit's prompting. I, I began to praise the Lord. I began to worship the Lord in my sickbed. I began to lift my hands up. No one was there. It was just me and God. I lifted my hands up, and I was in a bunk, and I can still remember sitting under that bunk, lifting my hands up towards the, the bunk slats and saying, God, I just want to thank you for your, your love for me, and thank you for giving me my life, and thank you for... And as I began to pray, it was like, it was like this... I, I don't know even how to explain it. Like this power from heaven just just came down on me and filled me with this peace and this overwhelming joy. I found myself singing and shouting praises to God in this state that I was in. And my, my whole perspective changed. It was just like, like it was this new perspective where I just saw that God was in control. Guess what? My spirit was at peace. I was still sick for two more days. He didn't heal my physical infirmity, but he healed me inside. And he gave me a perspective on his sovereign controls. <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful illustration of this kind of thing, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, my friends. Now, we don't, you know, I'm not saying that when you're, you have the stomach flu and you do that, same thing's going to happen. It's not a formula here. You may have to suffer through it, and you may just to look, have to look at the dark corridors and just look at Jesus through them, right? This was a, just a, a case where God just happened to do that, to teach me something. God only does miracles, by the way, when it suits His purposes to teach us. 
doesn't just do it so that we can create some magic. Right? It works. Have it like at our fingertips, like, ooh, you know, I can just snap my fingers and this is going to happen. No, that's not how he works. Yes, God heals, saves, delivers. There's miracles in Jesus' name, but he distributes them as he sees fit in accordance with the faith that he's given us. And that's, that's from the scripture. But contentment, see, contentment and joy, they're closely connected. How can we rejoice? Always. And again, I say rejoice when th things are going lousy, when we're sick, when we're not feeling well. How can joy be our strength when we're experiencing these weakness? It's, it comes to the, to the understanding of what the Bible means by joy, friends. That's what it comes to. Joy is not just a feeling, it's a choice. And again, I say, rejoice. Praise the Lord, all you people, even when you don't feel like it. Praise the Lord, because He's worthy of our praises regardless of what happens here. Regardless. Boy, when you choose to rejoice in God rather than in your circumstances, God's joy comes forth. And it's not going to go away like a feeling of happiness that's plucked from your, from your container and then deposited just as quickly. It's there. It's underlying. It's always there. And that's the difference. When you have Christ inside your spirit, joy lives inside of you. He's always there. We just have to turn to Him. You know? Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for He is with us. And when we are His bride as the, as the church is, where the Spirit of God is no longer living in the temple out there, the Spirit of God ha is living inside of His people, He is always there. The source of joy is in you. Don't forget this when you're going through a hard time. Praise Him. Thank Him. And even if you have to suffer through it, he will give you that inner joy. And you'll know Him. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah reminded the people that despite their past disobedience, it was God's will that they listen to His Word and come to a fresh understanding of what He had done in setting them free from their captors. Christmas the holy day, holy day, where we celebrate the birth of Christ. It's not something that we see as a, a feast in Scripture, but when we look at the life of Christ and we recognize this is a time that we set aside to remember what Jesus Christ has done in setting us free and giving us eternal life and giving us freedom in Him. It becomes this holy day. And friends, you may have messed your life up royally. I have. Maybe someone else messed up your life royally. You live in a fallen world. But guaranteed this much that God has not forsaken you. He's not leaving you. And even though sin leaves its past scars, God doesn't want you to weep and mourn over what cannot be undone. He wants you to look to Him and praise Him for this day in which you have been saved. A day of rejoicing when you came to the Lord. And if you've never come to Jesus today, you need to recognize this. I pray that you would to forget that He wants to fill you with His divine presence. He wants to forgive you of all of your sins. And He wants to make you new. All you have to do is believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the praise of God the Father. And if you believe in your heart and you really believe and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. And for those of you who have made that commitment to Jesus, you are children of the King, no longer shadow of the King in darkness. This is cause to rejoice. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your shepherd leads you. He is with you all the way. He's closer than the mention of His name. You can recognize the joy of the Lord and thank Him.
Amen.